I um, have the privilege of inviting Harriet to come up and share her testimony today. Thank you. 
our senior citizen. So ha as, as that happens, obviously Harriet made reference to her granddad, uh, Roger. Uh, and of course, Roger, because of the various chemotherapy and all the issues surrounding his illness, uh, he's not able to be in amongst this crowd. However, he is going to come. We're going to open those doors. He's going to be standing outside and see his granddaughter at that time. So that's going to be pretty. Well, I'm, I was going to say it's going to be emotional, but it's already emotional. Really good. Um, so that will happen. So at the very end, what we're going to do, the children will come back in. They're going to share what they've been up to. Then we're going to baptise Harriet with uh, Roger watching from there. So please don't go and greet Roger. Leave him be. Uh, but we want to know that he's, uh, he's joining us. I wanted you to be aware of that. Okay, so Harriet did a fantastic job. Well done. Um, and so, with that in mind today, I'd like us to think a little bit about what it means. I wonder if we could just pull that, this um, thing down. Could someone do that for me? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Graham. Just a little bit noisy to say the least. That's better, isn't it? Okay. So, with that in mind, I'd like us to have a bit of a think about what it means to go on a journey of faith and decide to follow Jesus. And I think journeys are amazing things. We had a journey yesterday down to Watford and back. Um, and during that journey, we took our, as, as has been referenced, we took our teenagers to the Soul Survivor Service of Watford in the evening. And two of them responded to the gospel and committed their lives to Jesus. A number of others also responded and received prayer, and God was at work powerfully in them as well. So it was a fantastic journey. Um, we've got some sleepy drivers' cars here. Nikki drove all the way to Watford and back, uh, and now she's just on the run. And so that's madness for you. So there was, was a true story of when Albert Einstein, the great scientist, was going on a train journey, and the conductor stopped by the great professor. Uh, to punch his tickets, and uh, Einstein was preoccupied with his work, and with great embarrassment, he was rummaging through his coat pockets and through his suitcase, sorry, his, his briefcase, and he realised he couldn't find his ticket. And the conductor said, look, we all know who you are, Dr. Einstein, I'm sure you bought a ticket, please don't worry, uh, everything's fine. And so the conductor walked on down the aisle, he was punching tickets for the other uh, people on the train, and he looked back, and he could see Einstein on the floor, flat out, looking under his seat, for the ticket. And so he walks back and he very gently says, Dr. Einstein, please, please, don't worry. It's fine, I know who you are. And Einstein looked up at him and he said, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> it's a little weird story. This genius of Einstein, he buys a ticket, he goes on a journey, he gets on the train, and yet he's forgotten where he's supposed to be going. And some brains are wired like that, apparently. But maybe it is a little bit like some of us. You know, we're aware we're on a journey, and that journey's called life. And we're enjoying the sights on the way, but, you know, are we entirely sure what the destination looks like? I was in Pontsbury a couple of days ago, and uh, some of the best people in the world live in Pontsbury, obviously. And Pontsbury has a very pretty Anglican church, very popular if you want to get married, by the way. Uh, and, and in, in Pontsbury Church, there was a, a choir master called Rob Yeomans. And Rob was a very enthusiastic choir master. And he used to try and get the less enthusiastic choir going by sort of really revving up. And, and, so, and, and there was one particular time where, where Rob was bouncing up and down, trying to get more life into the choir's singing of a song, which was ironically called, I Wonder Where I'm Bound. And as, as Rob was bouncing up and down, I wonder where I'm about. Trying to get a lot of life into the choir, the iron grid beneath his feet gave way, and he just disappeared into the church's central heat, heating duct. Uh, so, so that was where he was bound. Um, where are we bound? Where will our journeys end? In order to arrive at our destination, we need to understand where we start from. 
you know, where do we start from? Because it's not good, you know, uh, it's, it's not good looking at the map and just focus on the end of the journey, is it? Think about it. Actually, we also need to know where we're starting from in order to track where, how we're getting there. And this, I believe, is true of our physical lives and physical journeys, but I think it's also true of our spiritual lives and our spiritual journeys. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at the Bible. I wonder if, um, Elijah, you could just put on the, uh, put it onto the PowerPoint, which is relevant, which I forgot all about in the things in my pocket. Uh, that's it, that's the one. Oh, I've, I've undone the thing and I've broken it. Um, oh, that's it, now we do it. Hey, there we go. So John's Gospel. And uh, so we're looking at this guy called Andrew, who's met this crazy religious guy called John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, it would appear to Andrew, seems to be talking a whole lot of sense. And this bit of the Bible describes the moment where John the Baptist introduces Andrew to this man called Jesus. From verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. One of them was Andrew, as will we'll as will become clear. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and spent that night with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Okay, so we're going to have a look at this. Andrew's standing around with this very unconventional rabbi teacher called John the Baptist. And Jesus walks past. So look what happens next. So first, John the Baptist makes this statement about Jesus. He says, look, the Lamb of God. What on earth is that about? The Lamb of God? What sort of statement is that? And actually, John expands on that statement uh, at another time when he sees Jesus. Jesus comes along and John says this. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, what does that mean? Well, John is a Jewish rabbi. And he uses a phrase that would make a lot more sense to his disciples than it makes to us not right now. The Jewish students who are listening to their teacher, John, people like Andrew, would have understood what was being said when John used this phrase, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, they had a very special relationship with God. He'd chosen them, he was relating to them, but they also knew that they themselves, they were imperfect, they were sinful, they had no right to relate to a perfect God. In fact, their actions, all the stuff they did wrong, uh, meant that they really deserved death. And to remind them of this, and to actually deal with their sin, a lamb was sacrificed. And it was a symbolic and an important moment each time in the Jewish religious calendar. But God also promised to the Jewish people that the ultimate leader, the great king, the Messiah, would come from their, their nation. He knew, they, they knew, that one of their prophets, a man called Isaiah, would predict that there would one day be a great king who would be raised up from the people of Israel, even greater than their greatest king, King David. So these young Jewish men and women, they knew that this spiritual leader was coming. They also knew that the prophet Isaiah had said other things about this Messiah, who so was predicting this Messiah, this king, this great leader, but also they said, he, Isaiah also predicted other stuff about him, which makes more sense when we think about this phrase, the Lamb of God. Here are some of the words of the prophet Isaiah predicting 700 years before Jesus arrived that this great king would also suffer. Listen to this. He was looked down on and passed over. This is what Isaiah predicted about Jesus. A man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pain he carried. 
our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. It was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment that made us whole. Through his bruise, we get healed. We're like sheep who've wandered off and got lost. We've done our own thing, we've gone our own way. And God piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him, on him. He was beaten, he was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb, there we are, like a lamb taken to be slaughtered. And so when this phrase, lamb of God, was used, it was referring to God's son, the great leader, who came as promised, but also came and died instead of us, in our place, for all the things that we've done wrong. He was perfect. He lived a perfect life. But his sacrificial death, like a lamb being slaughtered, paid the price that you and I, none of us, could ever pay. You see, the price needed to be paid for the failings of the human race, and that price could only be paid by a perfect human person. And Jesus has been the only ever perfect human person. So as we believe in him, as we put our faith in him, at that moment, our spiritual journey begins. It's an unusual phrase, the Lamb of God. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about that. So what happens next? Well, when Andrew follows Jesus, they immediately, they go after him. Uh, and the question I then want to ask each of us is, who are we following? You know, and the person we're following, do they know the way? Because that's quite important. Or, are, or is it a little bit like following me in my car? Because I never really know the way. <laughs> Anyone use Satnav or, or, um, or Google Maps or whatever? Um, we find that last night when we were going to walk, but they're a bit scary, aren't they, Google Maps and Satnav? So, I always think of my, it's a voice speaking to you, a strange voice. And can I feel that you're entirely in the hands of a person that you've never met? And, and I, I, pers- I, I, I personify, I make, I make personal the, the whole sat nav thing. And I, and I honestly, this is a confession to you, I feel guilty <laughs> if I don't obey the sat nav. <laughs> you in a situation is clearly taking you the wrong way. And you have to disobey. And honestly, I, I think, oh, I don't really want to offend them. <laughs> well, clearly a little bit mad. <laughs> Sat nerves are great if they know the way. But, and, uh, and if we want, if we're going to follow someone, we really do need to know where they're actually going. And so, in our story, Andrew starts to follow Jesus. Because that's the beginning of the journey. He begins the journey. But notice, he's keen. From the beginning, he's keen to know, where is that journey taking me? And this is obvious from the conversation that takes place. So firstly, Jesus says this. He says, what do you want? Rude, huh? It's pretty blunt. Yeah. What do you want? Uh, I probably didn't say that. Like but um, what did you want? What do you want? But actually, it's a really, really important question. Because when we come to Jesus, and as we come to Jesus, he may well ask that question. What do you want? And I think it's a valid, re, re, uh, valid question. And the reason it's valid is because people come to Jesus for all sorts of reasons. People pray for all sorts of reasons. People turn to church for all sorts of reasons. People come with all sorts of thoughts and questions and expectations in this room. And I believe there are people in this room who you genuinely really, really need to know this. You really need to understand Jesus meets us where we're at because he's so gracious, he's so kind. He doesn't allow mixed motives or other agendas to become barriers. Last week, Matt brought a very significant prophetic word about barriers that exist. Uh, But he's so gracious, he doesn't allow those barriers to, to prevent us from reaching him because he removes them. These mixed motives, these other agendas, they're not barriers. Jesus reaches out. Let's face it, right? If all of us needed completely pure motives to come to God in prayer, how many of us would ever pray? None of us. None of us. We come to him, all of us, with stuff, with baggage. But we trust in his grace and his kindness and his love. So it's a 
It's a big question, Andrew. Why are you approaching me? What do you want? And Andrew's reply is fascinating. He answers the question with a question. In answer to Jesus saying, what do you want? Andrew says, <laughs> nothing. He just, Andrew, says, Andrew says, where are you staying? I've got your attention there. Um, so Andrew says, where are you staying? That's another strange thing to Why is this passage full of strange things? Lamb of God, what do you want? Where are you staying? What is he, what is he asking that? Now, I don't think Andrew asks that question because he's particularly interested in the B&B facilities in and around Galilee. I don't think, you know, the way, when Andrew says, where are you staying? He doesn't expect Jesus to whip out a brochure. You know, places to stay in and around Nazareth. You know, sort of things like, uh, well, this one's nice, but the fish is a bit overcooked. And, uh, you know, this was friendly, but they ran out of wine and someone had to do something about that. And, uh, you know, uh, and this was a good atmosphere, but honestly, the locusts in honey, they were just extortionate price. I'm not sure Andrew was looking for that sort of response when he asked the question, where are you staying? I think Andrew asked that question, and I believe that the heart of the question was this, Jesus, I'm looking to follow you. I need to know where you're staying so I can come so I can see it for myself. There was much more to Andrew's question than simply an interest in the board and lodging facilities in and around Nazareth. I think, uh, and it's a question I think we can actually ask Jesus ourselves. In effect, the question is really this. Jesus, if I follow you, where are you taking me? Now that's a question surely we want to know the answer to, isn't it? That is a question. If, Jesus, if I'm going to follow you, where are you going to take me? You know, if I come with you, where am I going to end up? And do you know what? Jesus' answer is just, oh, just typical of Jesus. I'm listening. You know, he says this. Come and you'll see. Oh, come on, Jesus. How annoying is that? You know, stop messing about. Tell me where I'm going to go if I follow you. And Jesus says, well, you come, you'll find out, won't you? And so we're back to the map. The ultimate destination is actually made clear. Andrew, uh, for Andrew, it's the place where Jesus is staying. Can I encourage you today? The ultimate destination for us is really clear. It's the place where Jesus is now staying. It's heaven. It's the place of eternal perfection. A place without tears or pain or sadness or sickness or death. That's the final destination. But what will it look like? And what will the journey be like as we go on our, on our way? And that's what we're going to learn, isn't it? Hey, Jesus, if I sincerely and I wholeheartedly follow you, what's my life actually going to look like? If I decide to walk closely by your side, Jesus, how's that going to be? And I believe Jesus says, come. And you'll see. Because this journey, let's not pretend, this journey has a significant faith dimension to it. See, we'd all love, wouldn't we? Because we're all control freaks, really. We would all love to see this great plan roll out before us. We'd all love to know what it looks like. That's not how it works. We need to decide what we make of Jesus' invitation. Because Jesus is saying, Follow me, and you and I are going to have some amazing faith adventures together. <clears throat> and Jesus is saying, are you prepared to step out in faith and take the risk and come on what will be the journey of your life? Jesus has recently said that to this lady sitting at the front, to Harriet. And she responded by saying, yep, in her own inimitable way. It's very black and white. <laughs> yep, I'm up for the journey. And that's it. Absolutely categorical. Last week when uh, Amy and Nikki shared, they both told us about how they responded to God, how that had transformed their lives. But at the time, they weren't given some sort of complete roadmap. That's not how it works. But we can trust Him. <coughs> even though life is challenging and unpredictable and even sometimes really difficult, we can trust that he continues to be with us, 
that his love for us helps us and guides us and sustains us and strengthens us. And in the midst of the big, treacherous conditions, boom, he breaks in. So Andrew went with Jesus. And what was his conclusion? Well, it's a pretty full-on conclusion. Andrew finds his brother Peter and he says this, We have found the Messiah. Andrew's conclusion is, look, this Jesus bloke, he's the real deal. There's no one like him. No one in the world is like Jesus. Andrew had become utterly convinced of Jesus' credentials. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the Lamb of God. The one who takes the way. The one who specifically died in our place. Andrew had spent all day with Jesus. He spent time with Jesus. And something happened to Andrew during that time he spent with Jesus. He was captivated by this man, Jesus. And as we come face to face with Jesus, can I just say to you, something wonderful and something powerful happens to every one of us. And in his love and in his grace, he invites us on this journey. And the question for every person in the room is, are we up for this journey? Because let's not pretend it's all going to be easy. But it's a journey. It's It's an exciting journey. Imagine someone who wants to travel widely all over the world, but only ever gets as far as the airport. You know, can learn all about the physics of flights, you can know which airlines have the safest record, you can choose the best plane, you can reserve your flight, you can drive to the airport, you can go to the gate, you can check the, the cruise credentials, get you nowhere unless you actually get onto the flipping plane. <laughs> Knowledge alone will not get you anywhere. You actually have to act upon what you know. You have to board the plane trusting it will take you where you want to go. And it's not enough just to know about Christianity. Because you can study it and become a theological expert. You can go along to church. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, it's empty. You finally have to take that step of faith and, as it were, get on board. Get on board by receiving his forgiveness and by entrusting your life and your future to Jesus. Exactly what Harry has said. So my encouragement to everyone in this room today is this. Just make sure you're on this journey. You see, the reality is this journey of life doesn't actually end in death. A lot of people think it does, but it doesn't. And so can I say to you that you need to follow someone who not only knows how to deal with life, but they also know how to deal with death. And can I say that Jesus knows how to deal with life, and he's proved that he knows how to deal with death. So. What we do is we find ourselves on this challenging, exciting, sometimes difficult roller coaster of a journey. And can I say to you that journey will change us? There are things actually we'll need to change about our lives. The Holy Spirit will point those things out, the Bible will point those things out, those things will need to happen. But Jesus says to every person in this room today, He says, Come on. In a nice way. Come on, give you a strange face. Come on! Now, Jesus says, come on. Let's do this. Let him take the wheel. Ensuring he's driving your life. Let him be in charge. Because he knows the map. And he knows the destination. So. For those who follow Jesus as Saviour and Lord, the final destination is a place of eternal peace. A place of eternal hope. A place of eternal love. That's where Jesus lives. And so if we say to him, where are you staying, Jesus? His response will be, come and stay. Let's pray together, shall we? After we prayed, I wonder whether someone could alert the children that they are to come back in. Let's pray.
Let's all bow our heads and let's close our eyes if you're able to do that and if you feel comfortable doing that. I'm just going to pray a very simple prayer, which I've prayed many times, just to want to come back and refocus my life and my spiritual agenda onto God. And I'm going to encourage us to pray. Well, I'm not going to ask us to pray out loud. I'm just going to ask us to own these words in our hearts. As I pray them, own them in your own hearts. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to say thank you that you are the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. Thank you for the reality of your death on the cross, bringing freedom and hope and forgiveness and life. Thank you for your resurrection. Today I turn away from any aspect of my old life and I recognize that as I do that, there are things that will change. But Jesus, I say to you, please take the wheel of my life. Please be at the center of my life. And please, for your glory, take me on this journey. Amen. Okay, open my eyes. There may be people who but that was like a prayer and recommitting your life to Jesus or maybe even committing your life to Jesus for the very first time. If that's the case, what I want you to do is either tell me, maybe, <coughs> tell the person you came with, or if you came with no one, just tell the person who sat next to you at the end of the service. We want to give opportunity for people to respond. So I think